A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you thanks for who you are. That your foolishness is far above all human wisdom. That your weakness is far above all human strength. Lord, we thank you that we can meditate this morning upon the cross, the power of God, upon Christ, the wisdom of God incarnate, crucified for us. So Lord, open our ears to hear your message. Open our eyes to see your truth. Open our hearts to receive your spirit who breathes now your word within us that we might be transformed, Lord God, in the truth and the light of your word. We surrender these moments before us. We surrender our lives to you, O oh God. So now may the words indeed of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And in the name of Above all names, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Christ Church. For those of you who are afraid we forgot communion, hang on. We didn't. I promise we're going to uh, spend time in the Word first and then let that lead us into the table afterward. And we will have time, a uh, specific time, in celebrating the table as well as prayer together uh, as we come through this, this sermon. So um, we've been working our way through the series of Lent, and uh, this is week three of six weeks of our Surrender sermon series. And last week, uh, Pastor Greg Brewer was with us, and wasn't it great to have Pastor Greg back with us? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, I, I was able to spend a few days in Montana with some, some brothers and on the back of a, a snowmobile and, and out in the wilderness. And I promise I was thinking of you at this time last Sunday, I really was, uh, in the Rockies. And, uh, but it was a, a wonderful time in the presence of God and, and brothers in Christ and it was refreshing and it was uh, precisely what, what I needed and uh, I was thankful for that time and thank, thank you for allowing us to have that. And, and Pastor Greg, uh, his message upon what does it mean to recognize that we are called, if we are called to be disciples of Jesus, to take up our cross and follow him. Today, as you probably already surmised through this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter one, we're going to continue in that vein. And so in Lent, like I said, this six weeks leading us up to Holy Week, we wanna make sure that you know that, that as Holy Week comes, it begins in just a few weeks before us with Palm Sunday. Hope you'll be able to join us. The services, the times we'll be gathering that week. Just want you to make sure these are on your calendar. <clears throat> Palm Sunday, of course, when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that week when he would be crucified for us. 
We'll come together that Sunday morning for a special service. Later that week on Thursday, we come together for what we call Monday Thursday. That word derived from that command that in Latin, mandatum, that command that Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. This is the institution of the Last Supper. This is when Jesus knelt to wash the feet of his disciples, even the one who would betray him that very night. We will come together and we'll celebrate around the table. We will remember as he's commanded us to do on Monday, Thursday. The next night, we'll be here in the sanctuary again for Good Friday, uh, where we absolutely kneel at the foot of the cross. We commemorate that event, of course, and we remember the seven last words of Jesus as they come to us through the Gospels, as he communicates what the cross is for, what the cross is about, and how we can receive life through his death. So I hope you'll join us. That's 7 p.m. on Monday, Thursday, 7 p.m. on Good Friday. Easter Sunday, of course, Resurrection Sunday, we'll have a sunrise service in Memorial Gardens at the back of the campus at 6.30 a.m. That's always a powerful, special time uh, as the sun comes up. We celebrate uh, time together there in, in that place. Uh, commemorating the resurrection of Jesus, but also looking forward to his return and our own resurrection. Uh, And then, of course, we'll have Resurrection Sunday celebration worship in here at 1030 that morning, and it'll be a great, great time. So please, uh, mark your calendars. Be sure to join us for that week. Holy Week is something we intentionally try to, to back off a little bit the week before and the week after so we can truly invest ourselves after the season of Lent in what that celebration is all throughout that week. Amen? So I hope you'll be with us. So today, picking up where Pastor Greg left off last week, we're going to talk about the wisdom of surrender. What does it mean to surrender? We've been talking about that these last two weeks in this series, and so I want to remind you of the working definition that we have been using to surrender. Pastor Greg reminded us last week, is the action of yielding one's person or giving up the possession of something into the power of another. Again, that definition of surrender, what does it mean to surrender? The action of yielding one's person or giving up the possession of something into the power of another. These last two weeks we've been saying, is that a very popular notion these days? Is that something that we see as a good? Is that something we see as as beneficial? I would argue that in our culture, we do not. We want to maintain control of everything that we possibly can, most certainly including ourselves, right? When you think of surrender, what is the image that comes to mind? My hope and my prayer is that after this morning, for every single one of us, From now on, when you hear the word surrender, the image that will come into your mind is the image of the cross. If the Apostle Paul were to summarize the gospel in two words, they would be Christ crucified. Two words that say so very much. But in Paul's day, many, of course, would struggle to understand Christ crucified as good news And again, I ask you, is it any different today? I mean, think about it. In a world like ours where might makes right and only the strong survive, you better be the best, the brightest, the fastest, the richest, the sexiest. You better be whatever it takes to win. In a world like that, how does the crucifixion of Jesus make any sense? If the cross of Christ seems like foolishness and weakness to the world, why in the world would Paul say the cross Christ crucified actually reveals the wisdom of God, the power of God, which can actually save us. So as we attempt to answer that question this morning, I want to point out that that in this passage, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25, Paul is not dealing so much here with what we call the, the atonement Paul is not writing in this particular passage so much about how how God works through the cross to forgive our sins and reconcile sinners to God through Jesus' surrender, through his sacrifice on our behalf. Now, Paul deals with that in plenty of other places, as you likely know. He deals with the atonement later in 1 Corinthians. He deals with it in 2 Corinthians and in several other places in his writing. But that's not so much his emphasis here. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is not addressing how the cross works. Instead, Paul is addressing another question. What kind of God would choose to work in this way? What kind of God would choose the cross and why? And if you listen carefully today to objections to Christianity, if you listen to all the young people deconstructing, these are the kinds of questions they're asking. What kind of a God? What kind of a God indeed? Surrendering your life to Christ. Losing your life, as Jesus says. Choosing to give it up for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. It seems absurd to a world obsessed with self. Self promotion, self-preservation. I need to do it myself. I must be self-made, self-determined. In order to be happy, you can't be happy unless you make yourself happy first. Have you heard that? Have you said that? Do you believe that? Some would call that the way of the world today. But the way of the kingdom is so opposite of that. Jesus shows us the only way to truly live, listen to me, the only way to truly live is to be willing to die. To die to your self. To completely surrender yourself into the hands of God as you follow him. Wherever he leads. Because if you follow him, he's going to lead you to some places you'd rather not go. He's going to lead you to some places you don't understand, places you would not choose. But will you surrender? Will you trust him wherever he may lead you, learning better to trust him and learning to live in his way, come what may? We've lost this understanding in our comfortable, affluent American Christianity. I want what I want, and I want it my way. And if this church won't tell me that, somebody else will right down the road. Otherwise, I'll just start one in my living room next week. This is why Jesus said, as Pastor Greg, again, taught us so well last week, you must be willing to lose your life, give it up for Jesus' sake. You must be willing to let God help you take your focus off yourself and place it on Christ. Die to self-centeredness and live in Christ-centeredness. For that, Jesus says, is the only way true life, life abundant, life eternal, the life of God within us can be found and known and experienced. It's the only way. A million other voices on TikTok or on your television right now will tell you there's any number of ways. Try them all and you'll find the end is the same. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. First Corinthians 1, verse 18. Paul recognizes that not everyone agrees <laughs> that Christ-centeredness is the way. And that's why he says, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who refuse to die to self-centeredness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is, is, is a message of surrender. That's why the cross is the ultimate symbol of surrender. It was for Christ, and it is for any who would follow him, for any of us who would become his disciples. So if the cross is the ultimate symbol of surrender, then it must also be the ultimate symbol of discipleship. To a world that is perishing, a world that is passing away, a world that is literally, spiritually dying, Despite all our attempts at self-preservation, to that world, the cross seems like foolishness. But to those who are being saved, those who have answered God's call, to those who have accepted the call of Christ to surrender their lives, to entrust themselves to him, the cross is seen as the power and the wisdom of God. Because the cross is understood by those at least so much as to say that the way of the cross leads from death to life. 
The wisdom of surrendering your life to God is found in knowing it is not about your self-determined life you are losing. Get your focus off of that. It is about his eternal life in you that you stand to gain. It is everything. But in our flesh, in our natural tendency to fight, we fight this idea, don't we? It doesn't make any sense. This is why Paul says it seems foolish to so many. How can we lose to gain? How can we give up to receive? How can we die to live? In the wisdom of the world, this doesn't make sense. It's, it's foolishness indeed. And Paul says as much. He goes on, quoting the Lord, speaking to the prophet Isaiah. This is what he says, going on with verse 19. Quoting Isaiah 29, verse 14, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, God says through his prophet Isaiah, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. What does it mean to thwart? That's an old English word. Try to use that three times today if you can. <laughs> to thwart means I will do away with it. I will set it aside. I will bring it to nothing. Paul goes on, quoting Isaiah still, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe, where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Has God made foolish the wisdom of the world in your own mind, in your own heart, in your own life? For since, Paul goes on, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. What is Paul's proclamation? Again, Christ crucified. Now yes, let me be clear. Let me be perfectly clear. To preach Christ crucified is also to preach Christ raised from the dead. And let's, let's bear in mind, if you don't believe me, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Read that this afternoon. The unbelievable treatise that Paul gives about the power and the meaning of the resurrection that gives point to all suffering, everything else that we're going to endure between now and then. So to say Christ crucified, yes, also means to say Christ is raised from the dead. But here in chapter one, we have to focus, we are talking about the cross because before the resurrection, there must be a cross. That way in Jesus' life, that way in any who would follow him. Remember, Paul isn't trying so hard here to tell us how the cross works. He's not trying to explain the atonement in this passage. Instead, he's trying to tell us what kind of a God would work this way. Paul says the wisdom of the world can't tell you. The wisdom of the world, the limitations of human wisdom can't fully explain it. The scholar, the expert, the debater, all the most educated in the ways of the wisdom of the world can't fully explain the way of the cross. So Paul says in God's wisdom, which is higher than our wisdom, which is fuller than our wisdom, remember what he also said through Isaiah, your thoughts are not my thoughts, God says, your ways are not my ways. God has chosen to not be known most fully through human wisdom, but through Christ, and even more specifically, through Christ crucified. If you want to know essentially about God, look to the cross. Paul says in what the world calls the foolishness of this proclamation of who Christ is and what God has done in him and through him, people come to faith in God and so are saved. It's a miracle, isn't it? But when that happens, when the Holy Spirit drops something within the depth of your own soul that helps you understand that he died for me, that he died that I might live, that God in his holiness, God in his righteousness, God in his steadfast and abounding love would give himself for me so that I might be redeemed, that I might be sanctified, that I might be made righteous, even though I know that I am not, even though that I might be no longer God's enemy as a sinner, but be redeemed and made God's son, God's daughter through the blood of Christ. But the struggle is real, isn't it? Paul knew it. That's why he goes on. Verse 22, 
He says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. What does he mean by that? Well, many Jews in Jesus' day we know this from the Gospels. We know it from all kinds of other extra-biblical sources. Many in Jesus' day and in Paul's day were looking for miraculous signs everywhere. Greeks were pursuing higher echelons of human wisdom and knowledge. Why? Because they believed that through those things, they would find the answers to their questions about God and about life. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So many today seeking signs and wonders. So many today seeking more and more and more knowledge, thinking that somehow God will be revealed undeniably. Somehow God will be proven unequivocally through these means. Do you see what God is saying? Look to the cross. And so when we continue... Certain Jews, we have to understand in Paul's day, were looking for these apocalyptic signs of the coming of the Messiah. Remember, there was that group that said to Jesus, show us a sign, show us a sign that we may believe. And Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation looks for a sign. He said, the only sign that will be given to this generation is the sign of Jonah. Remember what that was? Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. Jesus was alluding that there would be a sign, all right. It would be him three days in the belly of the earth, in the tomb, Christ crucified. These certain Jews Paul is talking about, they believe that, that when the Messiah came, that he would be the one who would make Israel great again. He would be a king like no other, greater than David could have ever been. He would possess great power. He would instigate political and economic reform and justice and prosperity for God's people. He would kick Rome out on their imperial you-know-what, and he would make Israel the power she was always destined to be. There were plenty that believed the Messiah was to be that kind of a man. The only thing the Messiah was not supposed to do in their eyes was die. This was a great stumbling block, <laughs> the biggest one you could imagine. That trips up your theology, that trips up your eschatology, that trips up all your ologies. If the one you put all your hope in dies. The word there, we translated as stumbling block, it, it, it's where we get our English word scandal. They were scandalized by this. They knew the law, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. How could the Messiah be crucified? How could this be? It made no sense. For certain Gentiles in Paul's day, whom he calls Greeks, Gentiles, the same group, these are all the non-Jews, so we're talking about all the people groups, put in those two categories. The question centered much more around Jesus' supposed divinity. What kind of a God lets mere mortals murder him? That idea was pure foolishness. That, that's not power. That's not strength. That's not greatness. In Greek mythology, human beings existed for one purpose, to serve the gods, to be the slaves of the gods. And yet this Jesus shows up, and speaking of himself, he says that he did not come to be served. He came to serve. And not even just that, but to give his life a ransom for many. To certain Gentile ears, to certain Greeks, that did not sound like the, the talk of any God they knew or respected or admired or, or feared. It sounded like foolishness. So are we any different today? Looking for signs and wonders that are unequivocally proving God's power and existence or, or actually maybe it's more that we just want to know that God is pleased with us and that God is active in us. We worship strength. We worship power. We believe that these are the vehicles by which we will change the world in human wisdom and human strength. We forget all the things that God has said, not by might, not by human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But, Paul goes on, Verse 24, but to those who are called. 
both Jews and Greeks, people of every tribe, nation, and tongue, from those all around the world, those whom God is calling to himself. Christ is the power of God, and he is the wisdom of God. Of God, his life, how he lives his life, how he gives his life, how he surrenders, the way he loves, the way he gives, the way he lives, everything about him, including his death and resurrection, his ascension. All of this is the demonstration of the power of God, the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than the most profound human wisdom, Paul says, and God's weakness is stronger than the mightiest of human strength. How does he go on to say this? Let me just, I don't have this on the screen, but let me just continue reading here because this idea, we we should be encouraged, church, because Paul goes on in verse 26. Who are the called? Who are those that God is lifting up? How is God's upside down way of doing things revealed in his church? Paul says this to the church in Corinth, and I believe the Spirit is saying it to us today. He says, consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish to the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one may boast in the presence of God. Why can't you boast? No matter how much money you have, no matter how far you've advanced in your career, no matter how many people look up to you, admire you, ask you for advice, no matter how powerful, no matter how strong, no matter how self-made, self, 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 self self-feed you are, why can you not boast? Paul says, verse 30, he is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, and redemption. You know what redemption is? Redemption is buying back a slave. Redemption is paying a price so that someone who is enslaved, now you have bought that person. Whether you give them freedom, whatever you do with them, that's up to you. But that's, that's what Christ came to do, to redeem us, to buy us back from our enslavement to sin, from our enslavement to evil, from our enslavement to death, from our enslavement to self. What kind of a God, indeed? We long to boast in ourselves rather than the Lord That's why the cross of Christ remains a stumbling block to so many in this world. That's why it's still seen as pure foolishness to so many others. We don't understand the power of God this way. We don't understand what it means to die, to live. We don't understand what it means to surrender everything. And in doing that, we actually find life. We actually receive far more than we ever could give in return. I will boast in the Lord. I will boast in Christ crucified that the God of all eternity, God the Son would surrender himself to the will of God the Father and that as one of us, a human being, he would take the sin of the world upon himself, bear it within his own body, flesh and bone, muscle and blood like yours and like mine and that he would do this so the stain of our sin As human beings, it could be removed, it could be cleansed, it could be purified by his blood. That's in the old covenant, the understanding of of all the instruments within the temple being, being purified by blood in the tabernacle before. It was all that this sanctified blood, which was thought to carry the life, could wash away the stain of sin, which leads to death. That's why we say he is our ransom. He is our Passover lamb once and for all. He is our redeemer, the one who has bought us back. Our lives, my friends, are not even our own, for we have been bought with a price, and it is costly grace indeed. It is the blood of Jesus himself that has bought you back from hell and the grave, and you don't even know it yet. Because Christ surrendered his life, in sacrificial love, in obedience, 
trusting wholly in our Father, you and I may live. Don't miss that. As we walk through Lent, as we get toward Good Friday, remember the sacrifice of Jesus and remember when he on his face in the garden prayed, if there's another way, if there's another way, Lord, if you would take this cup from me, Father, but when the will of the Father became crystal clear in his own heart and mind, he's prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Do not ever take for granted the surrender of Christ. Sometimes today I, I hear Christians talk and they talk about as Jesus, he knew everything. He just came down here and just kind of walked through everything knowing who he was and what he was going to do. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't hard. It wasn't challenging. It didn't cost him everything. It did cost him everything. And he surrendered and he chose. We sing that song above all. But that last line, it's not entirely accurate. There was one Christ was thinking about above any of us upon the cross, and that it was the Father. For the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? He knew that through the cross, through his death, that he would once again be set back in glory at the right hand of the Father from where he had come from before the beginning of the, the foundations of the world. He trusted with everything, even when it took him through the belly of death. He did this, trusting wholly in our Father that you and I may live, not simply exist, not simply going through the motions of life like dead men, dead women walking, but live, live abundantly in the power of the cross, to live in freedom from bondage to sin and bondage to self, free to no longer live for ourselves, Paul will later say in 2 Corinthians, but to live for God. Free to flourish in his love for us and share it with those around us. And lastly, we can live even free from the fear of death. Do you know that? Do you know that so much of our self-preoccupation, do you know what it really boils down to? Fear of death. How much we fight every way to preserve ourselves. How much our self-centeredness leads to our fear of death. Christ-centeredness frees us from that fear. The writer of the Hebrews describes it this way, talking about exactly what happens through the cross in this regard. Chapter 2 of Hebrews, verses 14 through 15, he says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of what? of death. The ancient church fathers used to say that it is by dying that Christ has destroyed death. Foolishness, right? Ridiculous. And yet, the proclamation of the word, truth according to the wisdom of God, so far above our own. The writer goes on, only in this way through his own death, could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Some of us in this room, some of us with us online, you are, you are a slave to the fear of dying. You didn't even know that. You've been proclaiming you're free in Christ for years, and yet you're still enslaved to that fear. The wisdom of God who is Jesus Christ himself. It, it, just as we say the word of God is most fully revealed and embodied in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, same thing most fully embodied in the one who we know as Jesus. He teaches us when we surrender our lives to God, we need not fear, even in death. There is a cross, yes. There is death, yes. But there is a resurrection to follow. Christians should be the ones who understand that. So much of obsession with self is based in, in fear. I think that's self-evident if we think about it long enough. But so much of our obsession with self, you know what it really is? It's, it's idolatry. Self-centeredness demands self-satisfaction. It demands self-deliverance. It demands self-preservation. It demands self-improvement. It, it demands, ultimately, self-salvation.
The world has bought the lie that life can be found if we are self-centered. In fact, that's the, that's the best way to find it. So the cross is foolishness to a world somehow desperate to save itself, preserve itself, promote itself, profit itself. The utmost irony is that any way of trying to save yourself, it only leads to spiritual death, not to life. This happens to individuals. This happens to nations. My friends, it happens to churches. Give your life away. The more we as Christ church can give ourselves away, the more life in Christ we shall know. When churches turn inward on themselves and they do everything they can to entertain themselves, when they do everything they can to just do what we like to do and just preserve, let's just protect our little corner of the world right here, God is under no obligation to prosper that. Do you hear what Paul is saying? The wisdom of God says die to live. Surrender to live. The cross shows us that. The only way to truly live is Christ-centered. So it isn't even I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So that as I live, when I die, and when I will live again by his promise, I am his and he is mine. Can you say that today, church? That's the ultimate question. Can you say that as an individual? Can we say that as Christ Church Nashville? Can we say as Paul did, Galatians 2, verse 20, again, talking on this very thing, can we say like Paul said, that my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body. How? By making my own way. By making sure I get enough seminars and I make enough money and I do enough this and I do enough that and I make sure I post enough on social media so people know how I care about all the hot topic uh, social issues of the day. No. No. Paul says I live this life by trusting. Trusting in the Son of God who loved me. And how do I know he loved me? He gave himself for me. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Have you made that proclamation in your life the same way Paul could? If not, today is the day, my friend. Today is the day to do it. That is the wisdom of surrender because when we surrender to God, it isn't about what we think we stand to lose. It is all about the one God promises we will gain. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the love and the life of Christ, his life and his power in us. So even as I right now ask our communion servers to come forward, ask our prayer team to come forward, and as we prepare to come around the table. I'm reminded of, of, of the last verse of In Christ Alone, that contemporary hymn. Uh, if, if you understand anything that, that Paul is saying here, then you understand what the hymn writer said when, when, when he wrote. He said, in, in no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can what? Can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the what? The power of Christ, I stand. My prayer for every single one of us today is that when you hear the word surrender for the rest of your life, you will think of the cross. And when somebody says, somebody says, what kind of a God? And you will say, the kind of God who shows his power and shows his wisdom and shows his love through Christ crucified. Amen. Amen.